Well, before um, making one last round of questions, uh, which of course are open also to uh, my colleagues I see uh, in the audience and to everybody who wants to uh, contribute to the discussion. I would once again like to thank uh, Wiener Berger and Ziege Verband for supporting this initiative. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, Patrick, Adam, Livia, Marina, Ernst, Manfred, Gerard, and Inge for uh, contributing uh, to organizing this thing. Uh, yeah. Now, the, the question I think, uh, I think we should ask, because uh, I, I think it's somehow the, although I don't find it anymore, but anyhow. Um, the question I think we should ask, because uh, I think it's the reason why um, we devoted one, at least one day uh, and some more time probably also to prepare to, to addressing uh, this book of 300, actually 301 uh, years ago, um, is actually if the question that I think uh, uh, Shumi posed, whether the um, cartographic operation in the world of uh, Dubravka uh, that Fisher does, that is uh, an attempt of ma mapping in his position by means of mapping the rest of the world, is actually a legitimate operation. Um, for Fisher, I think the, the answer was simply relatively easy because he was like, there was no problem in such an imperialist project because it was simply the architect of the emperor, so it was part of his job being imperialist. Um, and the universalism was equally given because it was Catholic and it's a very clearly Catholic uh, project. Uh, very, I think the, the, the difference, uh, for instance, with uh, Picard and Bernard is that that's very clearly Protestant or even deist project. Um, so this was clear for Fisher, but for us it's a bit less clear, uh, also because there's no more emperor and so forth. Um, my, my question is if we are legitimated in doing this thing, um, by the way, I, I also want to mention here uh, one of the Austrian ghost that we always have to mention, that is Hans Hollein. I think in the Biennale curated by Hollein in 1996, uh, maybe you know better than me, um, the title given by Hollein was The Architect as a Seismographer. And it's pretty close to The Architect as Cartographer, uh, although it's not exactly the same thing. Um, I think for Hollein that was still let's say, a question that shouldn't be legitimated. Um, for us, I think it's different. And, um, and the question I simply address you is whether you think, in, in the different specific fields, as architects, as historians, as uh, theoreticians, uh, if you think this uh, operation is legitimate, and what are the conditions that you, the limits that you would put to uh, such an operation. Uh, I think as someone who never has problems in starting with complicated questions, I think I give the word to Sam, so. <laughs> and then you, you decide who, who goes on. I thought this might be the moment for some uh, karaoke rather than <laughs> cover versions. <laughs> um, I, I would say, yeah, what, what are the limits? Well, I, I think it clear, clearly an idea to, to map the world comes freighted with all kinds of complications which, which uh, uh, we are probably sometimes aware of, but, but uh, much more than 
or yeah, as you said, like Fisher and his many other counterparts were, were not bothered by these issues of um, imperialism and so on and so forth. Um, but I think, I would say the making of the map is not the problem. It's the way in which the map is made. That's to say, are you making a map which attempts to describe the entire world, often with yourself at the center of it, or are you making a map which is essentially a map of, let's say, the limits of your own comprehension of the world, in which case that map is then revealing, let's say, the, the problems, the prejudices, the, the, the knowns, and the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Um, and so that, that then, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then that becomes, a, that becomes a way of revealing not just a subject matter, but revealing, let's say, um, uh, like the, the, the politics or the ideology, uh, ideology of the problem itself. Because I, I think clearly we still want to know what is, what is the world, who are we, where are we, and we shouldn't stop doing that, but we should recognize that you know, we, I, are not the center of it. And we, we're not, I think, all the questions that Shimi was asking, we should be aware of the, you know, what legitimacy we have for whatever reason, looking at whatever subject we have in terms of the way in which we describe that thing. That's what I'd say, Shimi. What would you say? Oh, thanks, man. Okay. I mean, um, legitimacy is a tough one, isn't it? Who are we to say what's legitimate? That thing changes as much as you know, seismic movements. Um, I'm in a state of consciousness now where legitimacy is something that I've been questioning because I've been given permission to question it over the last few years. But I would hate to be the one in position of stating where the boundaries are, where the parameters are. And I think oftentimes it's that task of those of us who are involved in the making of space that is where the problems fall, precisely in circumscribing where the rules are and what one is allowed to do and use. So although I brought up the question of legitimacy and although what you know, struck me on looking at Fisher is like, where did you get the balls to do this? You know, who gave you the right to talk about this? And possibly I'm reflecting my own, um, you know, my own position as well in that I do kind of, in the way that in the society that I've grown up in, I am circumscribed by lots of different things. So legitimacy is a weird one to have kind of pronouncements on. And I mean, I'm sat next to Sam and I'm kind of relaxed after the presentation. So I'm bound to think of music legitimacy and, and kind of relate this back to Sam's metaphor of sampling. I wouldn't want to be puritanical. I enjoy hip hop. So I'm not sure that uh, legitimacy is something that I'm like hardline on, but as an historian and as somebody who teaches, um, I don't think I teach architecture. I, I think I, I'm allowed to spend time with my students thinking about who we are, where we are, and what we want to do. And in that, in that respect, I think I agree with you, Sam. I think that the sort of mapping or cosmology of, of making some kind of sense, I'm happy with that. And obviously, it's a human urge. It happens. Um, across the world. But when making one kind of sense becomes a uh, priority or a ambition, I think that's, that's obviously where we, we ought to be at least conscious of when we're adopting that mentality. No? And um, there are still practitioners around today who profess the one true path. Um, and I find them just as amazing <laughs> as I find Fisher's audacity. No? So uh, let me see who I can pass on to. Um, I don't know, um, I'm passing on to you just because I enjoyed um, some of the cross currents we shared in the presentation. I don't know if you want to talk about legitimacy or um, position in the world, because that's what I was thinking of with I am Pei. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You, uh, you know, I, I think of it maybe as two roles. One is a practicing architect. You know, what does this cartography mean to me as a practicing architect? Uh, and then I think about myself also as someone who is interested in the culture of architecture. How, what does that mean to me? The, the, as a practicing architect, certainly I think about the cartography as operative tool. You know, what does it do for me? And, and uh, thanks to Sam's presentation, got me thinking about music the whole day. I, I remember um, watching an interview of David Lee Roth, 
after he broke up from Van Halen, and he said uh, he was being interviewed, and someone asked him, "What do you want this album to do?" Like he didn't say, "I want this album to make people crazy. I don't want them." You know, he said, "I want this album to be so hot after you play it. When you put it on the shelf, it will burn the other records." I, I think for me, that is measuring up yourself against history. You know, <laughs> whatever that is. I don't know if. Uh, Fischer von Erlach wants to burn Hildebrand, or vice versa, or want to blend in. I think somehow the, the, the structure of the cartography of history, for me, allows for that to happen as a practitioner, you know. And certainly, uh, when I think about uh, the examples of sampling versus um, a cover, you know, I think of, oh, um, what's the difference between uh, Venturi, Scott Brown, and Caesar, you know, like, is, uh, uh, I have a sense that if a student of architecture, maybe they do not know the work of Hawksmoor, Gropius, or Van Brau, you, you go to see a Venturi Scott Brown building, I think they have a sense that they want them to know where they took the sources from, as opposed to someone who uh, don't know about Loos or Mendelssohn or Corbusier, they go to see a Caesar building, I think they have a sense that Caesar is doing everything to hide where the source is from. So for me, there are two different ways of utilizing that cartography of history as, as a practitioner. And, and I think secondly, as someone who is generally interested in the culture of architecture, I think the notion of history uh, was important for us when we did the, when I co-directed the Chicago Biennial, because we were asking the question, like today, with the internet, uh, with social media, when information is infinite, when everything is available at all, every time, uh, there's no more structure. You know, you, students can look into an image, they can tap onto it. For them, everything is equal. So I think there's a desire for history to give it a form of hierarchy for me. You know, and I, I, I love what Manuel Hurt said for him. Um, the Antwerp was something that levels it in a way that um, uh, the cistern, you know, in Constantinople and the building of Jerusalem is on the same level. And I, I think, in a way, uh, Fischer von Ellach, you know, didn't use chronology as a structure, but use samples or type as a structure. And that, that for me is a structure that perhaps we can introduce a structure that people could, yes, it's not a hierarchical structure that you have to follow chronology, you have to follow type, but allows people to understand that everything is not equal, but you can tap into it at different moments. So um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, uh, Martin. Okay, thanks. Uh, no, the, it's really fascinating what you say, um, uh, both on, on the, the whole issue of history now, which I think is, is something that is obviously very much <coughs> at the center of our reflection also as architecture historians and teachers of our architectural history, where we face exactly this situation where everything is basically at our fingertips um, and the question of how you construct narratives and how you sort of or just reveal structures uh, within that flatness uh, is of the utmost uh, importance. But before I go into that very briefly, I would like to go back to the whole question of cartography, because one of the things that I think that historical work on the Antwerp does is perhaps show that it's not a cartography, yeah? or that if it is a cartography, that it's a very par partial cartography, a contingent uh, 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 cartography, which also is a cartography that exists in dialogue. So, uh, uh, in a way, the, what the, for instance, the, the simple work of source hunting reveals is that a book in the uh, early 18th century never stands alone. It never exists as such as an, an island and also as a kind of complete entity. Uh, copies change, the whole project, I mean, modifies between 1712 and 1721. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk about is how, for instance, the English introduction uh, uh, is completely different to the German introduction. So what I think the early modern book, such as the Antwerp, uh, teaches us is that you can think about books and cartographies as incredibly inst unstable and permeable uh, constellations, even if they are published as an Antwerp for a kind of universal history, even if they have the imperial seal of approval, even if, of course, 
you could say the imperial colonial enterprise is sort of inscribed in every page. Uh, there is the medium itself is inherently uh, unstable. And I think that is something that we can actually sort of use now uh, when we have to sort of try to navigate the kind of flatness uh, uh, that we have. Both, and there I, I agree, Mark, by making these kind of tentative stories. Secondly, by, again, showing that these stories never stand on their own, but are always or should always be dialogues. <coughs> that we then think about the power structures and the institution structures that sit around uh, these dialogues. But perhaps also uh, by thinking uh, of new ways of making, you could say, post-narratives, where we just say there's so much, there's the plenty, and we have to perhaps start reading without understanding, uh, seeing, looking without really interpreting, and see what happens there in that particular uh, uh, condition. But I don't know what my esteemed colleague, uh, Karin Van Eck, thinks of that. I saw this coming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are various things to be said. Yeah. Um, one is about the legitimacy of architectural history in the context of the entwurf. Oh. Yeah, um, one is about the context or the legitimacy of architecture and the gestures that create it. Because listening to all the talks today, I was very struck that we've moved here into a completely different world from, say, Alberti, yeah. who in the prologue of his book on building says that architecture is the foundation of society, and hence it's obvious that since it's the cradle of society, its history needs to be written, and there's a very clear way of doing that. Yeah. This is all gone completely. Instead, what we have are some gestures towards other legitimizing traditions like the Bible or the seven wonders of the world, which don't really work, in my humble opinion. And we have a very deep sense of unease about uh, what I think you would now call the disciplinary status of architecture. Um, because ending with a book about vases, even if the author connects them to his own biography and to the history of architecture, suggests that in the end, the distinction between architecture and sculpture, or perish the thought, the decorative arts, is extremely porous. Which made me think about a parallel process, which is the complete transformation of the reception studies of classical antiquity which in the past 30, 40 years has moved from a study of literary reception of texts toward a reception of objects and how they move across time and place. So how, for instance, the temples in Paestum move through images but also through copies in cork towards all museums from St. Petersburg to Brazil. That, I think, is an emerging discipline which will help students who, with all the information we now have on the internet, are completely lost in history. Because you can design trajectories. You can map, for instance, how editions of uh, Pianesi map onto developments in the decorative art in Russia, for instance. Um, with architecture, it's more complicated. Also because, and now I'm speaking as a historian and clearly not an architect, Architecture always has this interesting position that it's a very distinct discipline with a very distinct relation to the built environment, which on the one hand makes it a much more comfortable position to be in because it's clear what you're doing and for what purpose, but is also, I always feel, quite restraining because the whole uh, civil effect of architecture and its close link to society shuts it off from other developments in other disciplines that can look much more freely at historical process and use very different methods. Because for instance, to take a very recent example, I don't know whether anybody has read uh, David Wingrow's book on um, uh, cultural epidemics, um, in which he takes the study of epidemiology from uh, the study of viruses and maps it onto the spread of classical objects. So what you do is you look at, uh, like in uh, viral epidemiology, you look at how uh, phenomena spread, but you also look, as in a real epidemic, at how the context between the individual persons or actors take place. Mm -hmm. And that's an extremely interesting model which you could, which you could very easily map onto architectural phenomena. But in my humble and ignorant opinion, it, it, this kind of discussion rarely percolates. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think the deep unease that the entwurf at the end of the day creates in me, thanks to all these very good talks, 
has to do with this positioning of architecture both in the Entwurf, but also its implications for how we look at architectural history. Now, who am I going to pass the ball on to? I think um, the speaker on Flaubert, I think, would be a good choice. <laughs> If I go back to the question, the legitimacy of, of, of this kind of mapping and, and um, endeavor of, of mapping the world, <clears throat> I think what, of course, there's, there's this kind of colonial, imperial uh, dimension uh, to it. Um, but what saves it a little bit is, is also the Bo uh, Borges. I'm kind of the literary guy today. <clears throat> the Borges quality uh, no, of, of, of this map, uh, because it's, it's contradictory, it's self-referential, it's um, mapping of maps of maps. Uh, uh, we know this wonderful text of Borges. Um, I can't recount it, but it, it's... <clears throat> and, and the map that can, contains itself, and, and <clears throat> yeah, and, and, and this makes it and this is the quality of, 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 of the Entwurf, which gives it a, a kind of, I would claim somehow, an anti-imperial quality at the same time, because it is contradictory. It, it, it defeats its own um, attempt of, of mastering everything. And, and I, think, I think this is quite uh, sympathetic. Um, um, on the other hand, I, th I, I do sense that, of course, there is a sense of... Um, let's say, violence or, or, or this uh, um, power that um, uh, what can you achieve through planning, through mapping, through architectural interventions that are vast. Uh, and in that sense, Fisher maybe points to something that is very true about the practice of architecture in general, that we practice that our practice inherently has a violent dimension. No? Whenever we, and that's why I'm really fascinated by, if I can say that, I'm fascinated by my own uh, um, um, discipline. I, I really love architecture because it, we make our hands dirty when we practice. No, we, we can never claim innocence. We are always, whenever we build, even if we build something super sweet and nice and lovely and blah, 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 we, we are doing it in a violent way. We are killing a tree, we are, I don't know, um, uh, disturbing the ground. Um, um, uh, and, and this inherent uh, kind of quality of violence within architecture, I think, is, is fascinating uh, because we can never claim innocence. And I think this is something that Fisher sensed. To just to um, um, uh, maybe, uh, I was asked a very similar question once. Uh, I did this uh, book on, on African modernism, um, um, where we were also, in a way, mapping um, uh, no, the African continent. Of course not. Uh, we didn't attempt to do that. But um, um, and then we had an exhibition that was traveling around the African continent, uh, and we uh, went to Togo, um, Lomé, and uh, the Goethe Institute was exhibiting this. And uh, after that was a conference, <coughs> and uh, one of the professors of the local school of architecture asked me exactly that question. Who gave you the right to document this? Why are you doing it? You white guy from Europe. Mm. And then, uh, I, okay, I, I need to respond to that, but before I could react, his, professor, uh, his colleague professor <coughs> um, attacked the, fir uh, the first professor who, who asked me that question. Why didn't you do it? You're the uh, architectural historian of, Lo of Lomé. Uh, it, it was your responsibility. And then a kind of a fight ensued uh, between uh, the two, which was extremely, uh, I don't know, vibrant, let's say. Um, um, but of course, it's a it's a it's a true question. Um, uh, that it's an uh, absolutely important question. Why was I doing it? Uh, who who gave me the right uh, to do it? And 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 what kind of also power relationship do I set up by trying to to do this? Um, um, and with this, uh, of course, I hand the <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> I often say when I'm asked, uh, what does it mean to teach in London? Um, how, um, 
I came to teach to London after teaching in Graz for four years, where I felt that I was double-coded as a body without the knowledge. I had the audacity to be both a woman and a woman with, whose surname finishes with each. I was from Yugoslavia, uh, or, or from parts of former Austro-Hungarian Empire and parts where Austro-Hungarian Empire never managed to reach born in a city which was Ottoman until 1870-something. I'm, I'm mentioning all this because I think that besides questions of legitimacy, what I think this opens up conversation is question of legibility. And precisely the question of legibility of the power. There is never known a situation which is without a, without a power. Someone who is sitting uh, in the audience can analyze the way this mic was ping-ponging in relation to who feels comfortable with whom, who knows whom, who is where in relation to the architectural setup that we are. There is a clear spatial situation. I would like to push back a, a, a little bit when you said dialogue, because I think dialogue is kind of Maybe dialogue, at least in one way, I understand the word dialogue is a conversation between two. Mm -hmm. And I think that with Fischer von Erlach, there is a dialogue because we keep calling him both Fischer Erlach and Fischer von Erlach. There is, more, there, is, there, is a, there is constant web of relation which is never fixed, mm -hmm. in which, and this, is, this exists on every single page. Of that, of that book exist in relation to these pages because I have been fascinated also with those pages in which he clearly shows that this is a drawing that he is drawing. The ones with the crumpled, so like corner of the page. So he's asking us to look at this and understand, and, or I don't know if he's asking because it's, it's too, super bold. To, I don't you know whether this is a conscious. I, can, I know that for Harun Faroki, it is conscious a decision as a process in working with documents to show them as documents in a documentary so that people watching his documentary understand that this is the context in which he is operating. This is completely different operation in relation uh, to the media than, for example, if we think of documentaries of Ken Burns who not only pans, zooms in into documents, but he adds a nostalgic uh, music when he is, for example, a documentary about something so current and violent such as Dust Bowl. Uh, these are two completely different opposite strategies in relation to their relationship, in relation to the media they are working with. Faroki wants us Consciously, and I learned so much about architecture by, be, by watching Faroki's film and reading Harun Faroki's work. He wants his viewer to be conscious about that this is the media with which he operates. This is that moment in which John Berger, in Ways of Seeing as a television show, when the camera moves, zooms on him and says, but pay attention, and points a finger at himself, I'm telling you this. Because he is consciously doing as a way to create as interpretive tools for others to understand the operation that media is doing, the question of legibility. I'm banging on this because I strongly believe that political subjectivity of this moment in time is predicated about political subjectivation in relation to space. The political subjectivity, maybe this was historically true, I should know this maybe more because I can't PhD from history and theory in architecture, but for, I think that for 21st century we can, we can put an out, kind of connection that po political subjectivation is spatial subjectivation, precisely because of a capacity of architecture to hide, to hide the power relations, to hide the conditions around which, you know. And what for me was really interesting when I was looking at the Herald, because I also didn't know what to do with all this. Uh, and you know how how to approach this without being like, what were you thinking? Is this slippery and messiness in which, which I don't know how this worked in that time? But I think that's also 
Question is why we are so fascinated to think, why do we make it with this now? And how do we think with this now? Is it, are we going to use it with kind of exposing all the problems in order to use it as this one way to kind of interpret this really incredibly complex relationship that architecture has with representation because there is no architecture without representation, which became even more complicated precisely because of the flatness of media in which the kind of the, 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 the exposure to images is, and then the reduction of all the types of, of all the types of drawings and ways of communicating into an image uh, is more, I feel less and less preventing this understanding of the space as a power kind of as a power relation as formed through power relation as conditioning power relations and for me this is something that I'm interested in how do we how do we how do we recover the, how do we create these interpretive tools not just and that's why I, this book is also interesting because it was a book people could subscribe to and pay okay there is a kind of okay the whole kind of he was out of work he needed to write like there is a, a kind of a, his economy of substance but it was also not necessarily targeting just architects. And it was trying to say, trying to kind of give certain web of relations in. Uh, I'm taking way too much of the mic, so I would try to put this, but I think that for me, this is something that I want to carry with from this day to day. And what was really interesting that each of us actually did mapping, kind of, this partial mapping, because I think it's always, it's great because mapping can never be total. And so then it's really, so it's actually important how do one spread the position in which that one really, when one looks a map, one has to look and knowing that there is a specific intention behind that map and to read that map in relation to the process and understanding that what is visi made visible also at the same time also hides certain things. That, that, you know, every archive has its shadow and it's often there are those many, many shadows. And so, so it's really interesting how there were so many times in which we saw almost the same pages and these pages were put in a various different web, in webs of relations and this allowed us to actually discuss with the, con con with the moment we are now in and not to necessarily be completely obsessed about the history. And I think this is something that is really important, at least for me. And I, and I think that uh, I will pass on the mic to the whole question of like the brilliant idea, let me just look at this in the reverse, which is also, you know, question of to which culture, from which culture we map certain relation with a certain media, which for me was, for example, when I first encountered the book that in so many ways really framed certain ways I do, both as an educator and I guess maybe I'm among theorists, think, think, a person who thinks about space through space, uh, but who made a decision not to, pra not to practice. Uh, pet architecture of Bao Wow, which was for me trying to uh, helping me try to come to terms with what was transformations of the space that were happening in in Belgrade and Niche and, and, and post Yugoslav context, in which I was I mean, still don't know what is the proper way to open this book because it's actually printed in Jap Japanese for in the Japanese tradition of opening of the books. So <laughs> have your own. <laughs> we are infrastructure as well. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I think I very much like this idea of one thing we can take away, whether it relates to legitimacy or not, is thinking about Fischer von Erlach as a media consumer, um, trying to understand are there differences in the ways that images are getting to him through physical objects, through prints, or through his own vision. Um, and contrasting that with the flatness of the way we receive images today. That was one of the kind of threads that I took away from today. Um, but specifically, I, um, and to prepare for the next handoff, I want to pivot back to um, what you were saying about the violence of architecture, because it happens 
not just in the meditation before the act of building and in the process of building, but you're also imagining the violence that might befall your building later, um, or at least I think Fisher was. Um, and to kind of pivot to a question for um, Hermann, would you say that, no, I really appreciated the way you showed <laughs> well, maybe I'll pose it and then we can see if other people will r respond for you. <laughs> um, but I really appreciated the way that you showed with such care the subsequent additions to the city palace of Prince Eugene and this, how the spacing of the bay changes. Um, and then we see in uh, one engraving Fisher's own ideal version of how the palace could continue to be built, maybe without violence, and then actually how it gets extended when it is completed by other architects. Same for the, the royal stables. He has one idealized vision, but he must be conscious of the fact that this will never be executed and last the, the test of time. Um, is, yeah, is, is, that, is there some sense of that power dynamic having to, will your building survive, basically, um, in the way that you were describing Fisher's imprint on the map of Vienna? <laughs> Help me. <No. laughs> uh, well, I, it's not really a direct answer. And, and it's more a bit of a commentary on what um, on what Manuel and, and what Caroline said. Uh, one thing is there's time dimension in in architecture that is really clumsy, particularly for um, Renaissance or pre-modern architecture. So architecture it took so much time to build these things that they never reacted to the historical circumstances in which they were produced. So architecture, in a way, is super reactive as, let's say, project, as cultural contribution, as drawings from the side of the architect. But at the same time, architecture is also another thing, that is buildings. And these buildings are, have an unbelievable inertia. And I don't know, buildings like St. Peter, they are taught maybe in one week. It's a decision of, of really, uh, a random decision probably by two persons most likely. And, and then this thing lasts 150 years and it really generates all the complication that, that, that Christian was observing through, through Durand. And, and this is not a, project, a, a, a process that was meant by um, by Julius II and Bramante. They, they actually had no clue, and they were just trying, and, uh, and, and the consequences are, in a way, predictable, but at the same time, totally unpredictable. And I think, th this I, I think has been the subject of a series of books recently. There's a gigantic book by Marvin Trachtenberg that's titled Building in Time, but I, I think Trachtenberg believes that, at least in Florence at a certain moment, the, the architects could control that process and, and, and like smoothly go through it. But actually, I think it's much l more problematic and, and much less, uh, uh, let's say, there's much less happy end in this, uh, in this story. And a thing that goes together with that, and, and I and I come back to um, to Manuel, is that's maybe my impression. It's also maybe also my taste, which is very questionable, of course. But my impression is that the closer architects, at least some architects of the past of of, of the Renaissance and so forth. The closer they come to power, to, to pure expression of violence, um, the more conscious 
they become, and this is obvious because you see the violence, but there's also a strange paradoxical thing that some of them, and maybe here I'm thinking of Bramante because, yeah, well, I, I'm thinking about that, but, um, but there's a certain sweetness that strangely generates in, in this situation. In the most dangerous uh, condition, there's a bizarre kindness that emerge. I, I, I think Fisher, Fisher is not so entirely sweet, I think. It's, it's much more of a responsible state employee. Um, but there, there are, and, and again, may, maybe Bramante is um, really my, uh, let's say, focus on this uh, argument, but there's a strange situation that takes place in architecture that by approaching the most horrible in a way that there's a specific poetry and also specific kindness that sometimes emerge. And this really, um, I think there's something paradoxical in this that I think has been perfectly understood by, by Ram Colas in, in many of his better uh, pieces of writing uh, that are fundamentally all about this thing, the strange kindness that emerge at the moment in which power is most terrifying, it's as if there is power for criticism that appear exactly the moment in which things are, yeah, horrible. Um, and I don't know if this is a very um, sweet <laughs> note on which to uh, conclude this debate. I don't know if Erman wants to... No? Christian, you want to end? Yeah. Short statement. I'm a big fan of Fischer von Erlach's architecture, but I have a hard time to see anything anti-imperialistic in the guy. Uh, this is pure imperialism, what's going on, and it's easy to explain where the energy came from. So the Ottoman Empire was no danger anymore since 1682, and the following wars, and the Counter-Reformation was working very nicely and very hurry, in a horrible way, and Karl Borromeus, the saint the church was built on uh, was part of the Inquisition and absolutely no sympathetic figure. So we are adoring here, uh, obs observe the adoration of a completely imperialistic system at the time. And this is why I juxtaposed Fischer with Durand's parallel because it's a completely different attitude and the social um, role of architecture being placed at the center with very strange side effects. So I, I, I I'm amazed how Durand gets rid of important architectural problems. And Architecture Palante, for example, is uh, that the basis is taken away when he says in, house, in prisons, uh, prisons should be quite nice places because there, we know that so many innocent people are incarcerated. So the, the idea that the prison should uh, convey some terror elements is absurd. And this makes me a little suspicious. This goes beyond uh, the, the level where I think um, uh, I can follow. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that architecture always needs money and power to be realized in the end makes us, as you said, get our hands dirty, which I think is not precisely what is happening. We, are, uh, we, we need to realize our ideas. We need money and power, and then we have architects like Wolf Briggs um, giving interviews that he would still build in the Ukraine with the argument in 100 years time nobody will talk about um, who was the commissioner of the building but only about the building's quality itself and this is something again in relation to the time frame after we have built something how is it connotated in 100 years time is Briggs right maybe I hope not that would be an argument if a wolf bricks building could last 200 years. <laughs> and here I think we can conclude. Ah, no. Maybe this, uh, this opens up this question. Maybe it's possible to be kind to this particular book precisely because historically it did not become this lens through which certain uh, canon of uh, ways of looking at the history of architecture 
has, is established in the ways in which some other books did that and simplified and erased certain relationships. But I, this was a decoy because I'm being really, really curious to hear from you, Paolo, Pierre Paolo. Why are you so obsessed by this book? <laughs> I like the book. No? <laughs> and how did you find, you know, kind of the stumble upon and the kind of the whole context in which you actually say, oh, this is this book and let me think about it. Given that you're directly addressing me, I think I should answer. Um, I think it's a strangely uh, interesting book in a contemporary context because it provides an answer uh, that is a fragmentary, contradictory answer to condition of, let's say, doing universal architecture which is what we are actually doing in our profession. We happen to work in very different geographical contexts in which we fundamentally do always the same in the sense that all of the schools in the world, and, and here I'm improvising, that they, they all teach sort of post-international style architecture in China, in India, in Africa, South America, and so, in a way, the, the space for real uh, difference and approach to architecture doesn't exist anymore. It, they still exist different cultures, they still dif exist different position of different architects, but it's not that even if I, if I would be Chinese and I would want to do Chinese architecture, I think it's not possible. The, the production is no more organized like that. At school, I, I have been told who is Le Corbusier and what are the five points of new architecture. Uh, that, those, those possibility doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Fisher looks at that from a position that is a bit strange because in a way is very conservative. Fisher is completely oriented, still oriented towards Rome. Uh, to his formation years with Ber late Bernini, the late Bernini very angry uh, because of his very unsuccessful trip to Paris. Um, but at the same time, um, by being to a certain extent a loser, by being in a cultural position, um, yeah, okay, he's, he's the architect of the emperor, but he's an empire that in historical terms doesn't have much of a perspective. Uh, it will last still for, for a long time, but it will start to be considered anachronistic as a political entity or, already couple of, not so much after the death of Fisher. So also the geopolitical position in which uh, uh, Fisher operates is uh, let's say, problematic. I think there's a lot of historiography at the moment on these empires that somehow didn't make it. The Ottoman, the, the Mughals, uh, uh, the Habsburg. Um, and this allows Fisher to use his strange position to observe the world from another point of view. Uh, it's really not the project of modernity. It's really not what go will go uh, through Loger, through Perrault, Loger, um, Fischer takes sides with the ancient in the Carrel des Anciens et des Modernes, and in a very strange, exotic way. And this, to me, has some potential because, in a way, in the end, it's always this thing that there's a history of the losers that has to be rescued. And yeah, that's why. Okay, thank you all for, for, for being here today. I think it was a very interesting conversation, at least for me. Bye-bye. Um,